The full 2023 CrossFit Games rulebook is out and it's come with a lot of changes, but those changes have been met with a lot more questions. Is it fair? Is it broken? I've sat and listened to the entire CrossFit podcast with Athletes Communication Manager Becky Harsh discussing the changes, their reasonings, the feedback, and we're going to break it all down together. Bit of a different video here today. This is going to be one for all of my fellow real CrossFit enthusiasts, you guys who want to know what's going on this season. I'm going to go through this. I listened to the whole podcast, took a bunch of notes, and we're just going to go through point by point. I'm going to put the timestamps to all the points. I talk about in the description below. So if you want to go listen to the podcast and hear what was actually said, instead of playing like 20 clips from the actual podcast, like I said, I'll just timestamp them. But we're going to go through it. We're going to talk about it point by point. There's a lot in here. So yeah, a little bit of a different pace of a video today, but I hope you guys are going to like it. So right off the rip, Chase Ingram and Becky Harsh talk about the need for athletes to have a say in these things and the need for the athletes to be heard, which means when they say things both online and in direct communication across it, they're actually heard and attended to. They're actually taking it into consideration. And it's not just like a, hey, sit down down, shut up, go over there, or tell you what to do when it's your time to go. And that really has been the vibe in the past with CrossFit. And you know, it's fine. Like CrossFit started as this backyard competition that came up and it had these roots and obviously Castro and all these people who really enjoyed that kind of extreme unknown and unknowable where it's like the athletes know nothing. They have no say, they just show up and who knows what they're doing. They could be going to Camp Pendleton. They could be going to, you know, swim in the ocean. They could be going to lift a bunch of weight. Who knows? We're not telling them. It doesn't matter. And obviously the unknown and the unknowable correlate in terms of the actual events is important to hold to hold something up in the CrossFit space but in terms of like when the competition is going to start when you can book your plane tickets how long you have to be there for all of these basic things and things they go on to talk about that are very important to have open communication with the athletes about so just to start it off that's very good to hear one of the big topics in this is the exemptions for the semifinals. so obviously we're going to talk about it in a second but all the semifinals and the way they've broken them up is very different than what they've done in years past but something we faced during basically the last two three years of COVID is athletes not being able to travel back to their country of citizenship which is still the rule to where you should be having to compete for your semifinal. So if you're from Australia, you should have to travel back to Australia to compete. But for a lot of athletes, maybe living, training full time, maybe going to school full time in the States, there's a lot of reasons and a lot of barriers that get in their way. And that's likely going to be the case for a lot of athletes again this year. But thankfully, CrossFit has proactively laid out a plan and a way for these athletes to get these exemptions. But one of the most important things in this is that they have a clause for financial hardship. So basically, instead of it just being like, oh, I don't have a visa or I don't have, it could be as simple as, hey, listen, this is really just going to set me back financially. And to me, that's that's huge to hear from CrossFit because I talk about it all the time. I'm a big proponent of professionalizing the sport, which this rule book is doing a great job of. But it's one thing that's really important is to recognize that CrossFit doesn't pay these athletes. They don't pay them a salary. They don't pay for their travel. So all of this is out of their pocket. Yes, they have decent prize winnings if you come in the top three to maybe five of the games. But outside of that, you're really making no money from the sport itself. It's all your outside brand sponsorships and partnerships. And so if you tack on a trip from the US back to Australia and back, that's like a 10 plus grand ticket when you take into plane, hotel, food, all that kind of stuff. You got to get there early to acclimatize the time change. Like these are all things that absolutely happen in sport. Like there are teams that have to go and play in weird places and deal with time changes and all that stuff. Sure. But the big one for me is a financial hardship for a young athlete. Anything that could potentially discourage a young athlete from being able to pursue competition is something I want to help. Obviously, again, just like in all sports, there are financial hardships in all sports coming up. If you're not as well off as a kid, you might not be able to play certain sports because the equipment's too expensive. But there are programs in place to help for that. And I think CrossFit being as small as it is can do simple things like this to help that process. One thing they went on to talk about to do with this situation was the amount of ores that are available to these athletes. About of Basically to me, what this means is that they are willing to talk and deal with these athletes on a case by case basis. They set a deadline for basically when you can submit your exemption request. And it's plenty far ahead of time. It leaves, leaves you lots of room to basically get this exemption in to get a decision from CrossFit. If you don't like it, you can go back to them and counter them, whatever. And it sounds like CrossFit is really Really willing to play ball. Once again, we've seen it in the past. CrossFit has been pretty closed off to athletes. Our way or the highway, do it or don't, move on, whatever, we'll find someone else. But I think now with like extreme top talent, big household names, big draws coming into the sport and the look to bolster our sport up, CrossFit realizes they have to work with the athletes. And so the amount of ores put into the semifinal process and being able to get these exemptions, I think is a good thing. The next big point discussed is the new system for creating an affiliate cup team or AKA having people be able to compete on your team. So in the years past, there was like a very obscure 100 mile radius you had to live within for a set amount of time, or you just had to be at the gym for a set amount of time throughout the year before the open. There's been like 12 different iterations of this ruling process for how you could either how you could legally be on a team, but it's really gotten as simple as possible this year, in my opinion. And it literally is just if you want to be on team, any team doesn't matter if I wanted to be on CrossFit Mayhem or CrossFit Torian in Australia, I could do it. 
All I have to do is be physically present at that gym to complete and submit my open workout. Three weeks of the year, I have to be there, that's it. And then I think it's the same thing for quarterfinals. But I don't actually have to live there. I don't actually have to live there. I don't actually have to train there. I just have to go there to do the open workouts. And one thing I find really interesting about this that I forgot to mention is that Adrian Bosma made a pretty hard line in the sand here with the fact that if you are, say, the example he used was a CrossFit Flowmaster working on seminar staff and you're gonna be traveling for work during the open and you own an affiliate and you cannot complete the open workouts at your affiliate, can you still be part of that affiliate team? And he said, nope, that's it, don't care, you can't do it. Hard line in the sand. You cannot be a part of your affiliate team unless you are physically there during the three weeks of the open, no matter what. So to me, this is an attempt to open things up a bit more to super teams once again. We've seen this crazy ebb and flow of like it started off as purely an affiliate cup. It was just who's the fittest affiliate, who's got the fittest people in their affiliate. And there wasn't a whole lot of elite level athletes in the competition. Most of the elite level athletes went to individual and then the ones who were like semi-final athletes always did the team. Then in 2019, during the implosion, we saw all of the super teams come up where it was literally a complete free-for-all. You could just show up the day of a competition with a super team and that was it. And if you qualified to the games through a sanctional event, you got it. But now we're kind of seeing the pendulum swing back a little bit, but also a little bit back towards super teams. And the fact that if you want to create a super team, it's very possible. If you live in say the US and you have three other athletes that are willing to fly down to your gym to do the open workout, stay there for three weeks, they can fly back home, whatever. Then you guys can get together a few weeks before the games and you want to do it that way. Now you can. My thoughts on this are kind of twofold. I think like in and of itself and like the core of what it is, the affiliate cup to me and that system does feel like the most cool and genuine. It's like legitimately who has the fittest affiliate, like who has in their box the fittest people in the world combined that can go and compete and win at the CrossFit Games. Like there's something cool about that, right? And when you introduce these people who don't actually go to that gym and they fly in and they're just all these elite athletes and whatever, it does take away from that and it's not so cool anymore as the affiliate cup. But at the same time, the reason why the Affiliate Cup is able to continue, I believe, is because of teams like Rich Froney's CrossFit Mayhem and Reykjavik and these few teams that pull in 99% of the attention to the team competition. If you don't have top end athletes competing on teams together, it's really not going to be that attractive for people to watch. And I do think CrossFit wants to keep the team format going, but they have to have it at least be somewhat feasible. I believe the individual competition makes all of the money for the CrossFit game, but I think the team competition is just one of those accessories that is, that is cool in and of itself. And and I think one day could be its own standalone thing if they perfect the system. So I think this is just CrossFit trying something. It's trying to allow those elite level athletes to combine and create these super teams if they want, but it's also allowing these affiliates to still compete as affiliates and it still has that kind of affiliate feel to it. So I'm kind of up and down with this one, but again, I think CrossFit's trying something here. The next interesting point to me was this idea of a zero score during the open. So basically in years past, if you had a workout that was deemed invalid, AKA you did a bunch of no reps or you didn't have the right weight on the bar or whatever, didn't matter the reason your score was invalid and you were just removed from the open. All your scores were wiped and that was it, you were kicked out. But now they have this thing called zero score, which they described on the podcast and kind of reading through the rule book just looks like basically, if let's say you just do a bunch of no reps, like you think you're hitting depth, but you're recording yourself in your home gym and you can't tell and you're actually not, and they deem you're not, but it looks to be unintentional as they say, which to me just opens up so much subjectivism. But anyway, as they say, unintentional or you unintentionally loaded your bar at the wrong weight and you're like, hand up, I did that after the submission deadline, what do I do? CrossFit has the ability to assess a zero score penalty, which basically just means for that workout, you get a zero. But for your other workouts, let's say it's workout two, your first workout is unattacked, and then you can still go do your third workout and your score will be normal. To me, this sort of seems pointless. Like I get their justification in the sense of like, you don't just want to kick someone out because of like this mistake they made or whatever. But it's like the point of the open is to funnel the fittest people to quarterfinals and then eventually on to semifinals and eventually on to the games. And if you take this as like a fittest person thing, a zero score is just as bad as being completely removed from the open. If you're trying to qualify for quarterfinals and you get a zero on a workout, you're not qualifying for quarterfinals. Doesn't matter if you win the other two workouts, it's not gonna happen. You get a zero in the world, like you're like dead last in that workout, you basically effectively didn't submit a score. It's the same as just getting an invalid score. So this part confuses me a little bit. I don't really understand why they need to do this. Like I think, you know, affiliate level people doing the open, which is obviously the vast majority of people doing the open, it's just like people in their gym and whatever. It still allows them to have scores on the leaderboard, which I guess maybe they care about. They want to be like, hey, look, my specialty workout came out in workout three and I crushed it even though I screwed up the last one I have a zero it's still hey look I'm top of my gym in this one workout like that might be it right it's a participatory thing and I think if they get $20 from all these people and then week one they just kick all them out it's like they're much less likely to come back and spend $20 again next year whereas if they can just give them a zero score and then they can still have the validation and the fun and the excitement of posting scores and leaderboard for workout two and three they're probably more likely to come back and spend their $20 the next year that's my thought following that they went on to talk about the fact that they're going to be willing to work with athletes after the cutoff deadline so if an affiliate manager for 
example, doesn't validate a score in time, it's not the end of the world, right? They're willing to work with athletes. They're willing to look at the score, make sure it was submitted on time. If it was a mistake, that's not the athlete's fault. They're willing to work with them. But again, this is like a level of subjectivism and gray area that's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, especially following what happened with Annika last year when she had that whole quarterfinal score issue and she ended up just being kicked out of the competition and not going on to semifinals. CrossFit seemed rather inflexible at that point. And again, I don't necessarily disagree with them. I think the decision was kind of like, you know, she didn't submit a score and that's just what it was. But the situation basically seemed pretty inflexible from CrossFit standpoint. Everything I heard from inside was that they just weren't really willing to do anything. And so this to me sounds like a bit of a revisal of that and a bit of a willingness from, from CrossFit to kind of work with these athletes if kind of little technical errors come in that aren't their fault. Another interesting comment on the team side of things was talking about locking in the team rosters after quarterfinals, meaning that you can pick your six, but you cannot sub. If you have injuries, if you have things last minute that prevent you from being able to compete, even if you showed up to the games, similar to Reykjavik with the Lauren Fisher situation, and they didn't have Katrin there as an alternate, they ended up using her, but they could have legally. If you don't have an alternate that's available and you have an injury, you're literally just done. Like there's no bringing in someone else who's not on your team's roster from set before quarterfinals. There's no waiting to see who qualifies at semifinals and then putting them in. Your roster is your roster, your roster. And let's say you put three games athletes, individual games athletes on your roster as a team, hoping maybe some of them won't qualify, but then all three of them go and qualify for the CrossFit games and you only have three people left. That's it. You're done. You can't add people after quarterfinals. And they're taking a very hard stance with that, just calling it that sport. So it's interesting. It's interesting to see the ebbs and flow here on the things that they're taking hard stances on versus the things that not. Another thing they talked about here was the bigger semifinal feel. Obviously, we we're having less overall semifinal events running, but the same number of athletes. They're just being condensed into less semifinals. So instead of having four semifinal events across North America, we now have two with the same amount of athletes just smushed in. And their kind of defense to this was it's going to make a much more interesting event, which I agree with. I think the fact that the top heat at these events is just going to be riddled with game talent. Like all of Europe is one event. North America is split into two. Like top heats at those events are probably going to have like three top 10 games athletes minimum in them, which is super exciting. Obviously, that's what we want to see as a fan and as a spectator. But in the heats below the top one, I feel like it creates a lot of problems. And what I mean by that is the fact that there's just going to be so much more to manage. Like you're literally effectively doubling, sometimes tripling the situation for athletes having to be managed at these events. And we know from years past, obviously, there's always going to be kind of like last minute screw ups and things that CrossFit has to deal with. And just adding numbers to this is definitely going to make a bit more of a logistical headache for CrossFit. And it's definitely going to open up the door for some more kind of technical issues during these events. But overall, the top heats, they're exciting. CrossFit's also being a lot more open and transparent with what appealable and non-appealable offenses are. So what an athlete, they can know going into basically the, the event, what they can appeal, what they cannot. They've set this kind of like to appeal rule to stop athletes from kind of abusing the system. So it's kind of similar. You would think of it like football or whatever, where it's like, you know, you can throw a challenge, but like if you throw that challenge and if the challenge is incorrect and you lose it, that's kind of the same with this. You have two basically appeals. And if you use an appeal and it's found that it's like, no, bro, like that, those reps were counted completely correct. You're wrong. You lose that appeal. You only have one more left. But if you get the appeal, apparently you get to keep. So it's an interesting process. I think having an appeals process is good, but like, I don't know. That's a lot of people being able to pick the appeals. Like in traditional sports, like football, basketball, challenges, appeals, whatever you want to call them, it's usually two per team and it's just the coach that gets to throw them. In this case, it's two per athlete. So imagine at the end of every single event, there's like 40 athletes that all want to challenge something like very minute in this. How long is that going to take? How much is it going to slow down the days? They've already talked about the fact that with bigger semifinal fields, things are going to be slower. They're going to run slower. They're going to run delayed. Like what are they going to do? Run one event a day in order to keep this thing moving? Like that part to me opens up some issues. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. Another thing that's interesting that I talked about was in the new drug policy and things like that. They're limiting backfill spots. So in the year past, we had that we had an incident down in South America where like spots one through seven all pop for drugs. It was like one pop, two pop, three pop, four pop, five. And then like all the backfills were popped. And then you had like the ninth place guy at that semifinal going to the games or something like that. I know that's not accurate, but something like that. It was down the line. They're basically eliminating that. There's going to be three spots after qualifying. So let's say theoretically you got three qualifying spots at a semifinal, then spots four, five, and six would be basically in the pool that if any of the top three popped, they'd go down the list and they'd be basically able to backfill. But let's say all six of those people popped, then spots seven, eight, and nine, they're not eligible. They can't go. They're just not sending someone to the games. If everyone in South America pops again, they're just not sending someone to the games. And it's like, stop taking steroids like that. I agree with that stance. I think that's a good stance. If you have that many people taking steroids, you don't deserve a game spot. Like that's ridiculous. So don't do that. One thing that I think CrossFit talked about towards the end of this, that's a huge dub for CrossFit is using a seating process to determine the 
final heat at the first event at the CrossFit Games. That's a big mouthful. But what that means is although, yes, we have a seeding process to get athletes into semifinals, this worldwide ranking system, that's not the one they're using. It's a different one. It's based off your semifinal performance. So it's based off how you did it at your semifinal compared to top athletes from other semifinals. And then they actually appropriately rank and seed you so that the last heat at the CrossFit Games in the first event is actually probably going to be the top 10 of the CrossFit Games or like the fittest 10 people there. And why that's important is if you are a CrossFit Games athlete, you know the importance of being in that final heat. You hear athletes talk about it all the time at semifinals, at games, whatever. It's so important to get there because then you're pushing against the people you're actually pushing against on the leaderboard. It's very hard to know how fast you have to go if you're in the first heat pushing against a bunch of people that you're destroying in that workout and then you feel like you're winning the workout and crushing it. But realistically, everyone in the last heat sees your time and then just beats you by a minute because they can go harder and you could have gone harder, but you just didn't know. And we all know that feeling, right? If you do the open in your affiliate and you're in the early heat and then, you know, all your buddies go in the later heat and see your time and beat you, you're like, I'm fitter than you guys. I could have beat you. I just didn't know that I had to go that hard. Blah, 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 blah. Like, it's, it's a legitimate thing. It's not just whining and complaining. And so I think that CrossFit is instituting this. It's just helping the fairness of the test. I think the first event is always a very pivotal event. And so having athletes kind of grouped in this heat system is good. The one concern brought up with this system is that how will it affect if an athlete competes in a semifinal that's like week one? Typically, you will always see event records get broken as the weeks go on because in with the same programming, which we've had in years past, which we have again this year, the athletes going in week three can watch the athletes go in week one. They can learn a lot from their performances. They can also know the times to beat. They can train for them and they can go and execute. So you will always see better performances in latter weeks. So how are they going to account for that? If they have la better finishes in like the top five at an event in the week three versus like the top two at an event in week one, how are they going to seed that for the last heat of the games? Becky didn't really have an answer to this. She just kind of said that we're working on it. We're talking with the athlete advisory council. So it's a real problem and they're going to have to figure out how to do it. But at this time, they didn't really have any solves. The final point that they made, which Chase Ingram said should have been number one in the rule book was the most important thing. He got me all pumped up. It was like a great retention strategy. It was like, oh, we're going to talk about the most important thing ever the best thing the best part about this rule book and then they talked about the fact that athletes qualifying for the crossfit games get an l1 or l2 paid which I, I, i'm not against like listen i held my l2 for like six years i was a crossfit a full-time crossfit coach gym manager whatever for like eight years like i love crossfit and i came up in that world and i believe that those certs are amazing and you can learn a lot and there will be athletes that take them just like for the fun of it but i think as the sport progresses as much as they don't want this to happen, the separation of CrossFit Games athletes from like CrossFit affiliate managers and coaches and people in that community is separating, right? Matt Fraser trained alone in his garage in Vermont. Mal is training alone in a garage in Vermont. Emma Lawson, she's training an affiliate, but she's not a coach. She's not going to be a coach. She has enough sponsors at 17 years old where she's never going to have to work while she wants to be a CrossFit Games athlete. Like, the need for these athletes to be in these affiliates physically and honestly even the benefit is starting to dwindle for sure that's not talking down on affiliates that's just the growth of the sport right these athletes at the top level are being focused on just that in the years past and even still a lot of, there's a lot of examples i get it but it's definitely dwindling in those like coaches and affiliate managers who have the time to also dedicate to be a top crossfit games athlete there are still a couple but they're definitely dwindling and the mal o'briens and the emma lawson's and that generation and the generation that's going to come after them is going to be much more just pure athletes using crossfit CrossFit as a sport, not really as involved in the community aspect of it. And I know a lot of people aren't going to like that and not going to like hearing that. And believe me, I'm from the old era. I'm, I'm, I've been here for years, over a decade. Like I get it, but I just don't think this is really an incentive that many athletes are going to care about. Definitely not one that needs to be the most important thing in the rule book, in my opinion. Sorry, Chase. Anyways, guys, bit of a different video, longer one. I want to go into this because it's obviously big. It's going to affect the whole season. And I found all this stuff super, super interesting. So comment all your thoughts down below. And we'll see you in the next one.